good. He is good always. And it is when we go through tests and trials and come through, even in the passing through of it, we can see God's hand and God's leading all the way. So let's be a thankful people, always giving, let praise and thanks always be on our lips. Because God, our God, is good. I trust then that you have had a fruitful, productive week. And that you are encouraged to study God's word, surrender to God's word, and to be sanctified by that word. I say what to kneel and pray and invite God's blessing upon the study this morning. Let's kneel in prayer. A wonderful God and the Father in heaven, we pause this morning to say thank you for your many blessings, your guidance, your watch care over us during the past days of this week. We have met challenges and trials, temptations unnumbered, but you have watched over us and the voice of your spirit behind us has said, This is the way. Walk ye in it when we will turn to the left or to the right. And so we give you thanks and praise this morning. Bless us now as we open your word for our study. Be present, Lord, to minister your Holy Spirit and holy angels amongst us that the truth might reverberate in our minds, in our very soul. And they all may be encouraged to press on the battles to the gates. We thank you, we praise you, and we bless your holy name. Amen. We are winding down our study on the reformer William Miller and the things that were associated with him in chapter 18 of the book, Great Controversy. We've been able to touch a few of these themes, and this morning we want to continue our look at the 2300-day prophecy. A very important prophecy, welcome, welcome brethren. A very important prophecy given in Daniel for the perfection of the church, because all scripture is given for that purpose. So there is prophecy or otherwise, all scripture is given for the perfection of the church. And on page 3 to 4, paragraph 3, line 8, it says that the 2300 prophetic years stretch far beyond the Jewish dispensation. So as Miller calculated, he saw 2300 years taken literally reach beyond the Jewish dispensation. By the way, when did the Jewish dispensation begin? And when did it end that Miller could have concluded that it reached far beyond the close of the Jewish dispensation. When did the Jewish dispensation begin, and when did it end? Anybody? I think we all know when it ended. That is clear. But when did it begin? There's a particular text in Exodus chapter 12 that I believe, if I'm right, will give us the indication of the start of the Jewish dispensation. Um, anybody want to try that one? When did the Jewish dispensation begin? We all believe it ended in AD 70. Unless someone has an alternative time. But um, in Esther 12 verse 2, God says something specific to the Jews. What was it that God said to them in Exodus 12, verse 2? Which I think is, in my estimation, is the start of their dispensation. 
Anybody want to go to the mic and read for me Exodus 12, verse 2? Exodus 12, verse 2. Moses came, um, Miller came to a conclusion, and you haven't read the statement, thanks, Angela, that may have crossed your mind. Okay. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Thank you. God, to Moses, through Israel, makes that statement. He was about to bring them out of Egyptian bondage and establish them as a nation. And he gave them an indication as to when they would consider the start of their national history. And what is referred to, him, I believe, as the Jewish dispensation. Now, realizing then that the Jewish dispensation went far beyond, all right, that the 2300 years went far beyond the Jewish dispensation, what should Miller have done next? And where should he have searched to? find information relating to the time of this prophecy. Where should he have gone? What should he have done next? I think the prophet Daniel was a very good example in this matter. What did Daniel do when he found that he could not grasp or understand apparently what the angel has said to him. What did Daniel do? Anybody? He prayed. Thank you. Daniel prayed. Daniel prayed. He it said he set his heart to searching the prophets and to pray. And Daniel 9 1 to 20 gives us the long prayer that Daniel made on behalf of his nation and the time of the prophecy and the intervention of God on behalf of his people. And so, um, had he done that and searched thoroughly, he may have found something that was missing. But what did he do instead? What did he say he do Instead, the very last two lines on that same page, in that same paragraph, it says something which to me is so uncharacteristic of Miller. That was not like Miller at all. We understand from his former experience that that was a strange thing that happened. What did Miller do instead of doing what he normally would have done? Can anybody pick it up there in the last line or two of that paragraph? He did what? Yes. He accepted the generally believed view. That is not like Miller. The Miller we know was a, such a thorough Bible student. Thorough Bible student. He never moved on from one word to the next until he thoroughly understood its meaning in the context of the verse. That was Miller. But here, he accepted the view that the earth was the sanctuary and therefore that the cleansing of this sanctuary, which he supposed to be the earth, would be the fires of the last days to cleanse the earth 
and the coming of Christ in glory. You see how one small mistake can lead down a very wrong, winding, twisting, turning road? And that offset the whole thing. Accepting the view that was then accepted instead of thoroughly searching out to find for himself. And sometimes though I wonder, why the persons then, and Miller now included, think that the earth was the sanctuary? Was there any biblical uh, evidence or thinking or suggestion or even a hint of a reference that they could have thought so? I wondered. It was not a Miller. James White, well, probably anybody want to have a thought of that one? Why, have you ever, if, has it ever crossed your mind as to why people then thought the earth was a sanctuary? And why Miller went along with that thinking? He must have been satisfied with whatever evidence he had from them that they were right. Why? Did people think the earth was a sanctuary? Is there any text in the Bible that says the earth is the sanctuary? You know, I'm James White in 1850, commenting on this error. He said, of the more than 100 verses of scripture in the Bible that use the word sanctuary, Four are mentioned in New Testament that deal with the heavenly sanctuary, and that there are two others, one in Psalms 58, and the other in Exodus, that people have thought to find some evidence for this supposed earth brain, the sanctuary. But he said, but on closer examination, you will find that it really referred to the sanctuary built on earth and not to the earth itself. So by misapplying, misunderstanding Psalms 50, um, 78 and the other one, the Esther, which, I, which now slipped me, um, they came to uh, Esther 15 verses, verse 17, and Psalms 78, verse 54. Um, Brother Peter has sent me some information also in that area. Where the word sanctuary refers to so many things. And then it boiled down where Miller had to between the earth and heaven as the sanctuary. Do we learn that there is a sanctuary in heaven? Miller was saying, heaven is the sanctuary, and the earth is the sanctuary. And so that led to the erroneous conclusion that were drawn. Any comments so far? Any comments or any questions so far on what has been said or what you have read? Okay. No questions. No thoughts. No comments. Now, Miller arrived at a wrong conclusion, and his ministry is going to be shaped by that conclusion. Because he can preach that conclusion, and he's going to search to find the start of the time and the conclusion of the time. And when he finds the conclusion of the time, Though hesitantly, he is going to be led to the point where he will declare a time when Christ will come. That is obvious. One thing led to the next. But let's start back, go back here to chapter 8 a minute in uh, Revelation. Between verses 16 to the end of chapter 26, 27, Miller did not find 
any evidence of the time for start of this uh, 2300 year prophecy. Daniel uh, Gabriel had returned to him. What did Gabriel spend time doing when he returned to Daniel in chapter 8? 16 to 26. He was commanded to make it known to Gabriel, to Daniel. But what did he do? Did Gabriel misunderstand God and did something else? Or did Gabriel did what had to be done, but the prophet could not bear what he was seeing? Can anybody help me here? What did Gabriel spend time doing between verses 16 and 26? Instead of telling Daniel, well, the time is this time, the year is this time. Anybody have an idea? We are Bible students. I'm not calling names, so I'm moving on. A close reading of verses 16 to 26 by the students indicated that Daniel spent time explaining the symbols given in the first half of Daniel and identifying who they were. And I suppose, as I read, it came to my mind that probably he did this to show Daniel that the time would be a very long time in fact. He also probably saw a time would come when people would, as I said last week, calculate 2300 as six and a half years or 1100 years. So, the, so Gabriel spent time giving the history of each nation. And I said last week, as I worked out Greece, more, um, uh, Persia, more than 200 years. Greece, more than 100 years. And then the horn, the little horn, which still exists today, but it's covering from 168 down to 78, almost 2300 years itself. And then he talked about who the prince was, the host. He called the prince of princes. So Daniel set the stage for their understanding the actual long, long period. So much so that when he was finished, Daniel upside down felt sick and fainted. He could not comprehend such a long time when God's sanctuary would be trampled on the foot and God's people will have been at the mercies of these three ferocious beasts. He could not stand it. Daniel fainted and became sick for a number of days. Then we have the famous prayer. And then, of course, we have Daniel in chapter 9 returning. I'm here this morning lecturing, obviously, um, to my class. A number of questions have been posed and I have had no answers. All right. Some people ask, what is the connection between Daniel 8 and 9 that, be, that led Miller to believe that verses 24 to 27 had anything to do at all with the 2300 years. Is there a connection between those two portions of scriptures? Daniel 9, 24 to 27, and Daniel 8, 14. Is there a possible connection? Have you ever seen the connection between those two portions of scripture? You know, as we read 
question always comes to mind that probably you have never thought about until you begin to read closely. Because to teach a class, the teacher has to have information to share or to assist class with the class, probably had cursory just glance over and did not pause to do the research on. And for those who are teachers here, you know what I mean. You have to know. And though in our age we are told that the teacher is no longer to be seen as a lecturer, but a helper, you must still know in case you're asked. And here in, I, I thought I found some answers, and you might correct me or you might say they're not what they are saying, or that you may have alternative views. First of all, was not the angel the same one who in the first place Daniel said he saw and had returned? So the same messenger returns. The same one in 8, 14, and the same one in 9, 24 to 27. Not a strong point, but it's workable. No one is the word mare, which Brother Saul touched on last week. The vision in Daniel 8.14 is the general vision. But then when Daniel referred, returned to, when Gabriel returned to Daniel in verses 16 to 26, he applied the word mare to the vision in verse 26. Understanding mare. And when he returned in 20, um, 9, 24, 23, he said, I'm now come to explain to you the mare. That is the time element of the prophecy. So whereas in 8, 26, he referred to the time element. When he returned, he said, I am now come to explain to you the time element. So that word mare referring to the time element, the specifics of the prophecy, is another word that binds those two portions of scripture together. And the third one is the word in verse 24, determined. Seventy weeks are determined. And we all know by now what a word determined means. It means what? Cut off. It means cut off. But it had to be cut off from somewhere. And the only place it could be cut from is 814, because nowhere else in the discourse between 8 and 9 is any other reference mention of the time that the 70 weeks could be cut off from. And so that is another uh, reason we find for a relationship between 9, 24 to 27, and 8, 14. Lastly, both of these texts deal with Christ's ministration for his people. First, for the Jews, his work for them to bring them to the place where everlasting righteousness could be brought in, but they haven't failed, as Paul would say to the Jews later on in Acts chapter 13, we turn from you to the Gentiles. So Christ's ministration is a unifying feature in these two chapters as well. Now, um, so Miller reaches Daniel 9, 20, 24 to 27. The angel had returned to Daniel and it explained to Daniel the 70 weeks. The 70 weeks. But though it explained Daniel the 70 weeks, it did not tell Daniel when these weeks will begin. 
And for Miller, it was important. Why? He wanted, having concluded, that it's been 300 years, meant the cleansing of the earth and Christ coming back. He was sure he would have found a date that he could say, Ha, Christ is coming back to the earth on this date. So he searches. Yes, Brother Glenroy. Good morning to everyone. Good morning, Brother Glenroy. Um, this chapter says an American reformer. Yeah. And it gives us the qualifications that made him the American reformer. Correct. We are in a world today where we are supposed to be reformers. Correct. Do we see the need then for the type of qualifications that we must have in order to be reformers? Mm -hmm. Because when we look at Mil William Miller, we can see obviously that there was a mistake made. Yeah. And for what I'm hearing this morning, we're reviewing history. But the review of history should bring us to the place where we are strengthened to go forward. Because to review history and then make the same mistake worth nothing. So we must, be, we must see what made him a reformer. The type of dedication that he gave to the service of God. The type of life that he lived. And we must go beyond that if we are supposed to be reformers in this way in which we live. So to look back at William Miller did this or William Miller did that, I don't think we're getting the best out of what the chapter is really saying. It is dealing with an American reformer. How he became a reformer. Now we are in a world today that is, I don't know what to say, except that it's full of sin. And we must be reformers in these days. We must come to the place where we are standing alone, so to speak, because we must be reformers. And the, in order to have a reformation, the reformation must begin with us. So we must see what we need to be reformers. The type of scriptural evidences that we need to be reformers. I'm going to show you something. Thank you. I'm going to show you something. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of um, Leviticus, right? Leviticus. And I'm going to show you what is existing in this world today. And the people of God must not be. Though, uh, as you go there, um, we will have dealt though with his qualifications in the first lesson or two when we dealt with this chapter, but continue. All right. Listen to what God says. I begin with chapter, verse 1, right? Chapter 19. Okay. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of Israel and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. So what should we be, brethren? We should be a holy people. In order to be reformers, we have to be holy. And holiness, like we heard this morning, is the putting away of sin. So we must begin to, if you have not yet done so, put away sin in order to be reformers. But I go a little further. Listen to verse 10. How we treat our fellow man. And thou shalt not glean every, every thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shall thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. See what is reformed? This is reformation, brethren. This is what is called reformation. This is the type of spirit that we should be of if we are supposed to be reformers. And not only American reformers, but reformers showing the difference between me and the other man, us and the other persons. But that's not all. Listen to this. Verse 13 says, And thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor. Can you imagine that? Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither shall neither rob him. The wages of him that is hurt shall not abide with thee only until the morning. This is reformation, brethren. We have to examine how we live, how we treat our fellow man, and change the way that we treat our fellow man if we want to be reformers. We think that is all? Listen. Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but thou shalt fear the Lord. I, the God, fear thy God, I am the Lord. See what, brethren? We have to be clear. We have to be a type of people that are not going along with the world. You know, this same chapter 2, let me go a little further, but 
for time's sake. In this same book of Leviticus, right? Chapter 20. I'm going to read this one, though. Verse 8, chapter 18. I'm going to read this one for emphasis. Listen to verse 22. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. And these are the things that are obtained in the world today. And we, as reformers, must show that there's a difference. I mean, the gospel is so clear. We must show that there's a difference. Our lives must have, must have an impact upon somebody else to the changing, brethren. You don't see what I'm saying? They must have an impact. So to be a reformer in this day, you must be able to stand alone. You may not have the support of anybody else, but you must be able to stand because you have the word of God. And that is where we must come. We must have the word of God for the things that we do. We can't just review history and the think that the knowledge of the history is going to do anything for us unless we stand upon the word of God? You think that Thank you. Um, All right, go ahead. No, no, I, I'm not sending you away. Um, is it going to be longer? Okay. Now, Brad, we have heard what Larry said. And what Brad Larry said is probably true. Um, as individuals looking for a kingdom, we have personal responsibility for ourselves. And also, the knowledge we gain is for the world, to be shared to the world, to our families. All that is true. All that is true. But I had deemed my purpose as teacher of chapter 18 was to review this chapter. And of course, um, as I said, we did touch on the qualifications of the reformer in the first half of the presentations, uh, probably lessons one and two, where we dealt up there the kind of man he was, his family, all that kind of thing. But he has brought home now to us personally what we should be as reformers. And I thank Brad Larry for his interjection very much. Anybody want to make another comment along his lines or any other line? This is Angel Angela. Thank you. I agree with what Brother Glenroy said, yes. But we're not just here in chapter 18 reviewing history. This is a chapter where we as Adventists, where we actually came from, one of our main foundation pillars. So we're reviewing it to consolidate, to see where he went off the path, and to learn and to understand this truth of the 2300-day prophecy, which is a strong, it's a foundation of our church, and the belief that we hold of why we are a people. And we have to know what we believe and why we are here and why we are seventh day Adventists. And this chapter is very important for that reason. It's not just a reviewing of history, it's a foundation that we stand upon and you must know it and understand it. That's why I personally believe that we should use the modern tools we have to put up the, you know what I mean? Yeah. As a teaching aid, the actual whole, that picture, you know the picture you have between the Trinity prophecy in different sections of it, and put it up and go to section by section. Uh, as the young people who are watching now on YouTube or here, our new members are now hearing this for the first time and understanding clearly for the first time. It's not just reviewing, it's standing and understanding what we believe. Thank you. Okay, um, all again that was said is true. Um, let's move on. Mistakes are made, and now we are told that a lot of people do not learn from history. So they are guaranteed to repeat the same mistakes because they have not learned the lessons from history. Not long ago, I said to the class that Miller did something that was so uncharacteristic of Miller. He accepted the then popular views that the earth was the sanctuary and apparently having accepted that, he stopped there and did not go on to search the truth for himself as he had been so accustomed doing previously. And that seemed to have come about because of a misunderstanding 
The then preachers had about two texts, which he accepted. Rather himself explored James White seven, eight years afterwards on exploring the texts saw that it did not at all refer to what he was saying. And so he gave a correct understanding with two texts. So one, we could have learned then from that aspect of history that by ourselves doing diligent work and not accepting age-old ideas and theories, we can avoid the mistake that others made. Is that clear? Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, it's the flow. Good morning. And one of the other important lessons is searching the scriptures and being able therein, by comparing scripture with scripture, come to a knowledge of the truth. And that's Amen. what is brought out there. And if you look and see the narrative there in Great Con, you don't have to just sit down and read and go. To, to be a good student, you need to sit down, take note of those verses, and see for yourself, study them, see for yourself, compare scripture with scripture, and follow his example. So that at times, you can even just take up the same, perhaps, say for example, Daniel 9 and uh, the same 24 coming down and so on, and read it over and over again until you truly understand what is being said here. Don't, we, we have to become less dependent on what others say and write and so on, and learn to explain things, which is what he would have done. So, um, and as we are saying, we are coming to the point, as we are told here by the brother, we are to be reformers in this time. Reformers must know the truth and not simply living well with neighbors and so on, but we must know this truth here and be able to share it so that when someone wants to know what you are holding to God, you will be able to spout from the word. It has said thus, this has come to pass, this will come to pass, and you will know it. So I want, along with what all of that was said, for us to be encouraged to get back here. I was reading this chapter nine earlier this week, and uh, looking to see what exactly Daniel prayed and said. And when you look at it, Daniel was praying a lot about his nation. He, he was very concerned for the Jewish nation. He was really concerned for the sanctuary within Jerusalem that was desolate. So that was all on his mind. While the angel was trying to carry him further, which the angel recognized he couldn't, Daniel didn't seem to be able to grasp much more. But it is written for us. Thank you. Daniel was able to write it for us. And we are therefore able to come, look, understand the matter, and consider the vision. And just one other quick point here. When you were asking about the connection between Daniel 8, 14, and uh, 26, 14 says unto 2,300 days, and 26 said evening mornings. And to me, therein lies the connection, knowing that a day is evening and morning. That was just Thank an you. earlier point that I wanted. Thank you. Any more comments, questions? Okay, we have reached a point, therefore, in the study where the angel has explained to Daniel the events 
in Daniel 9, 24, 27 of the 70 weeks. We have made connection between that portion of scripture and Daniel 8, 14. But what Miller wanted was to find a date to start. Where did his search lead him? To Ezra. Ezra, now, the verse 25 or 24 says about the commandment. That commandment said two things. Had to build and restore. Two things have to be done. So you have to find a commandment that offers both things. Now, in Ezra, three commandments are made, but only one of them mentions both. And then, there's a chapter 7. I leave it for yourself to go home and search what that commandment said that caused Ezra to recognize, yes, this is the one. Though, in chapter 6, verse 14, Ezra listed all three of the commands. Cyrus, in chapter 1, had mentioned one command. The rest had also mentioned another command. And after Xerxes, the third command. And could someone stand then and read me Ezra chapter 6, verse 14? Ezra chapter 6, verse 14. Thank you, Sister Vashti. Morning, everyone. Good morning. Ezra Good morning. 6, 14. And the elders of the Jews builded, and they prospered through the, prophesy, through the prophesying of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Adu. And they builded and finished it according to the commandments of God, of the God of Israel, and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. A key word there is the word commandment. It is a commandment. A commandment. In other words, Ezra, think of Sister Vashti, viewed the three as one, as a whole. And though Artaxerxes' command was most con uh, thorough in that cause, sorry, Cyrus, in chapter 1, 1 to 4, gave us a building, the rest in chapter 4 for building, but after Xerxes for both restoring and building. And his aspect was the setting up of the sanctuary services under the priest, and just in law and order. I said that magistrates and judges that neither of the two former ones had mentioned. So it was not only a matter for him of rebuilding, but restoring Jerusalem, Judah, as a political, economic, religious society. Law and order prevailing. And so here in Chapter uh, in Ezra, the time is given both in seven and six. In the seventh year of Artaxerxes, history shows that Ezra came to the throne in Artaxerxes came to the throne in 464 uh, BC, 464, 465 BC. And the seventh year was four, five, seven, four, five, eight. And four, five, 
Seven is taken as the year because of how the kings then counted years. So 457 was reckoned as the seventh year of King Arthur Xerxes. And having understood that 457 BC was the year for the date given to Daniel 9, verse 24, seven weeks, Miller was able to calculate the 70 weeks of years which made for 90 years, as everybody knows, 70 by 7 give it for 90 years, prophetically speaking. And that, that for 90 years, when added to 457, brings us down to the year AD 34. And just one, to so just finish off this uh, thing just quickly, don't want to return to it. Um, but in Daniel 9, 27, there are two broad segments mentioned. 70 years to the Jews and the remainder. 70 weeks to the Jews and the remainder. So 490 years go to the Jews. 70 by 7, 490. That, that was allocated to the Jews. And since we agree that the 70 years were cut off, from 2300, that left 1810 years. Because when you subtract AD 34 from 1844, which was the whole garment of the prophecy, you are left with 1810 years. So, two broad elements the time to the Jews, and the next remaining part to the Gentiles, as it will be referred to. Also, Daniel 9.25 gives us three broad categories. Seven weeks, sixty-two weeks, and one week. Three segments. Seven, sixty-two, one. He tells us what the seven weeks were for. The restoring of of Jerusalem. Sisdu was unto Messiah the prince when he was baptized. Messiah means anointed one when he was baptized there by John. Um, and then the one week remains. And then it says in the middle of the week, Messiah will cut off crucifixion of Christ. And since we are speaking prophetically, that one week will mean seven years. And half the week, Three and a half years. So Christ baptized in AD 27 by John. Three and a half years down the road brings down to AD 31. And then the end of that week, AD 34. When Saul, referring to it, says, We turn to the Gentiles. We turn to the Gentiles. And we have the Gentile age began. So the Jewish dispensation we know ended as a people in AD 70, in AD 70 with the destruction of their temple. But the gospel had gone to the Gentiles as a whole because of the Jewish rejection of it in AD 34. Any problem there? Any comment there? Any question there? All right, then, um, I think I won't spend any more detail on that explanation. We have to learn from the past. As someone says, it is better to learn from someone's mistake than learn from your mistake. A wise man always learns from others' mistakes. We saw how Miller, though he was an astute student of the word, made a simple error by depending upon others rather than do what he always did. And that flaw created some problems. And we are still even labeled today because of that 
error that was made then. So we, as we are just informed by three who spoke, we have to learn from history, learn ourselves how we can be reformers in truth. We have to take everything which both Sister Newton and Brett Lemmer said, learn from history, search for ourselves, know the truth and be sanctified by that truth. Uh, so Angela says, history is important. Our history as a people is important. We should know it because we are going to be attacked on it from time to time. And we should know it. May God bless us all to this end. I have one more session to go. The after someone else, I believe, will take up the lesson. Let us pray, please. Wonderful Father, you who are the revealer of secrets, you who are the explainer of your word, you do not leave your people in darkness, but you send angels to be at their side to explain and clarify and to edify them as they search for truth as for head treasure. We see Lord Ray Miller made his mistake, but you need not make that same mistake that he made. Because we need, if we are to be reformers, to be asked you close reading students of your word. And not our eyes with eyes salve, dear Lord, and may the white robe of Christ's righteousness be placed on us day by day. That we may walk in the light. We may walk in truth. That we may walk conscious of souls around us. That we will not be stumbling blocks. But that we will be lights to them as in a dark place. Bless your people, we pray, dear Lord, and continue to minister to us. Your word today through your manservant. And to whoever else, Lord, shall be used by you. We thank you for your dear name's sake. Amen.